I'm Brian O'Neill, and this will be another full hour of Newsmakers. Coming up at 8.30, it'll be the regular show with uh, Dr. Robert A. Heineman talking current events this half hour, though. It's going to be another one from our series from the Kevin Dorn shows. This one from 1983. Kevin's on the phone here with an anti-communist activist named Karen McKay. Karen McKay, who was a former volunteer with Special Forces, had a lot of military experience. She talks about her work with an organization called the Committee for a Free Afghanistan. Afghanistan had been invaded by the Soviet Union in 1979. Here we go now from July 3rd, 1983, Kevin Doran and Karen McKay. There was a war there once upon a time. We don't hear much about it anymore, but it's very much real, very much going on right now. We have Karen McKay with us. Karen is with an organization called the Committee for Free Afghanistan. And good morning to you, Karen. Good morning, Kevin. How are you? You are in the nation's capital, I believe. Indeed we are. All right, now, Karen, you have an organization there, or you're in an organization called the Committee for a Free Afghanistan. Is that right? Yes. Is this some kind of a government agency? Oh, absolutely not. It's a private, non-profit, 501c3 organization. Contributions to it are tax deductible. And uh, we are an information uh, organization uh, committed to helping Americans and uh, from the president through Congress and, and down to John Q. Public understand the issues involved in Afghanistan. What's happening there, why it's happening there, what it means to us as Americans, and what we can and should do about it. Well, Karen, uh, let me ask you a question about Afghanistan that I think most Americans would um, probably ask. Why should we be upset about Afghanistan when the Congress isn't terribly upset about communists in Nicaragua? I mean, really, how can we get excited about Afghanistan on the other side of the world when the Congress doesn't want to give money to people uh, closer to our shores than, than, say, Texas is to Washington? Well, the ironic thing is that uh, Congress is overwhelmingly in support of aiding the Afghan people with, with effective military and humanitarian aid. Uh, somehow members of Congress who are opposed to our aiding Jodo Savimbi freedom fighters or the Nicaraguan freedom fighters are able to see Afghanistan as a very clear-cut case of Soviet aggression. Um, while they don't see it as Soviet imperialism, they see it as aggression. They don't make a connection between one and the other. But I'm pleased enough that they are willing to support the Afghans. What happens, however, is there's a disconnect between the will of the people and the will of their elected representatives and the will of the President of the United States and getting something into Afghanistan. Uh, now, why should we care about it? Well, it? It reminds me of Neville Chamberlain and uh, the British uh, demands of what about British guarantees uh, uh, to Czechoslovakia. And Chamberlain said, what is Czechoslovakia? People of whom we know so little and they're so far away. And then he shrugged and he says, besides, it's all academic. There is no more Czechoslovakia. Well, Afghanistan is today's Czechoslovakia. The invasion of that country poses a very real threat, a very urgent threat to the security of the free world and indeed the continued uh, existence of civilization as we know it. Because from their southern bases in Afghanistan, the Soviets are only 350 air miles, that's uh, about 20 minutes by MiG fighter bombers, to the Straits of Hormuz, that narrow bottleneck of water in the Persian Gulf, through which flows 70% of the free world's oil. So a look at the map of that region, and it's very easy to see why we should be excited about Afghanistan. That country is pivotal to the Soviet encirclement in the Persian Gulf and Asia. And indeed, they've been trying to occupy it since the time of the Russian czars as long ago as two or 300 years ago. Well, my understanding was that the Afghans themselves were under their own communist government. Were they not prior to the invasion? Well, not really. Uh, in 1978, May of 1978, the Soviets sponsored a communist coup in Afghanistan. The Republican president, Daoud, was murdered with all of his family and all of his advisors. It was a very bloody coup. And the communists took over. Within a few months, it was very clear that, uh, that they weren't going to last because the people rose up in resistance to this, this communist uh, coup. Uh, the Afghans are a very fiercely independent, God-fearing people who don't want any foreign influence in their country. Least of all, a, a communist, uh, atheistic, uh, um, non-capitalistic government, a totalitarian government, running their lives in Kabul. 
And so they re there was an instant grassroots uh, brush fire resistance all over the country. And it was very clear to the Soviets that, uh, that their puppet, Taraki, was going to lose the ball game. Uh, before, they, before they could do anything about Taraki themselves, Taraki's own prime minister, or deputy rather, murdered him and uh, all of his family and advisors. That was a man named Hafizul Amin, and he took over. Well, he lasted about three months because he was even closer to losing the country. And so the Soviets decided, well, if their surrogates weren't going to be able to do the job, they'd have to invade and do it, you know, blatantly and do it for themselves. The Soviets always prefer to take over a country through internal subversion, internal wars of national liberation and coups, so they can keep up this pretense that it was uh, all a local affair and that they were only invited in as, as advisors and, and helpers and, and so forth, friendly limited contingents, which would then be given base rights and, and so forth. And in Afghanistan, it just didn't work. They didn't didn't calculate well the nature of the Afghan people, who in 5,000 years have never been co uh, uh, conquered, never been successfully occupied. Karen, we have to take a little break, and I'll be right back with you. I want to talk about the actual fighting, what's going on day to day. Right now, we'll take time out. Afghanistan, still a big topic in 2019 as we near the year 2020. Uh, former President Obama had a hard time getting the troops out of Afghanistan. President Donald Trump, same thing. So U.S. involvement there has a long, long history. We're going to be back in just a moment. Stay with us. From the Fox Sports Studios in Los Angeles. Here's Eddie Garcia. In college football at the Independence Bowl, Louisiana Tech shut out Miami of Florida 14 to nothing for La Tech. They've won six straight bowl games for Miami. They've now lost nine of their last ten games in bowl action. At the Quick Lane Bowl, Pittsburgh outlast Eastern Michigan 34 to 30. Pittsburgh quarterback Kenny Pickett had three touchdown passes, two in the fourth quarter, including the game winner, which is 47 seconds to play. In NBA games of note, the Mavericks down the Spurs 102 to 98. Dallas star Luka Doncic returned from missing four games with an ankle injury. He had 24 points in helping his team get the win. Jazz over the Trailblazers 121 to 115. Donovan Mitchell 35 points to lead Utah Knicks over the Nets in Brooklyn 94 to 82. Double overtime with the Timberwolves to get by the Kings 105 to 104. That was in Sacramento. Pistons uh, beat up on the Wizards 132 102, and the Grizzlies down the Thunder in Oklahoma City 110 to 97. I'm Charles Payne, and this is the Fox Business Report. Tesla shares have topped $430 for the first time after Wall Street analyst Daniel Ives of Wedbush offered upbeat comments about the company, saying demand for Tesla's Model 3 car is picking up in the U.S. Tesla shares are up 77% in the past three months. But shares of Dutch biotech company Kyogen lost about a fifth of their value yesterday. Kyogen says it has rejected takeover offers and that it has ended discussions with potential buyers. All three major averages closed in record territory yesterday, helped by Amazon's strong holiday season. The Dow was up 105, the Nasdaq up 69, topping 9,000 for the first time, and the S&P was up 16. That's your Fox Business Report. I'm Ginny Cosola, invested in you. Guys, waking up over and over to pee is not okay. You can reduce those nighttime bathroom trips with the ingredients in Super Beta Prostate P3 Advanced. You can try a full 30-day bottle free. Just pay shipping and handling. No strings attached, no obligations, and no commitments to buy. Call 1-800-424-7125, 1-800-424-7125, 1-800-424-7125. Today at the Simmons, Rockwell, Nissan stores in Horseheads and Hornell, you'll find new 2019 Nissan Sentra SV models with alloy wheels, cruise control, and Bluetooth for only $15,999. Or new 2019 Nissan Titan S Crew Cab 4x4s with a 5.6 liter V8. Rear view monitor, power windows, and cruise, now only $32,499. See the savings online at Simmons-Rockwell.com. All right, we're speaking with Karen McKay. Karen is with an organization called the Committee for a Free Afghanistan. We're talking about that war over there. Karen, what's going on day to day? Uh, how many Russian troops are in there, and what are the Afghans doing to resist them? Well, we estimate that right now there are probably 
a good 250,000 Soviet troops in there. However, there's been a, there's been a significant buildup during the summer, and uh, there's been a lot of uh, exchange of troops, so we don't really have a solid fix. But it's got to be between 200 and 300,000 troops right now. And what are the Afghans doing? The Afghans are fighting back uh, like no people have ever fought in history. And they're, they're winning a lot of tactical victories. They're paying a hell of a price to their population. There have been um, probably hundreds of thousands of casualties in the last several months. We know that uh, at least 10,000 people have died in the, in the Konar offensive. The Soviets in this past month have carried out the largest offensive since World War II uh, in, the, in the Konar Valley and the Logman areas and so forth, trying to cut off uh, the freedom fighters and the refugees from Pakistan. As I understand it, Karen, the Russians apparently are, are not hesitant to go so far as genocide. In other words, they're willing to wipe out whole villages if necessary. It's absolutely genocide, and it cannot be called anything but. The, uh, it is a systematic destruction of the support base of the freedom fighters. Uh, you know, Mao Zedong wrote the guerrilla movement of people as the fish moves in the sea. In Afghanistan, the Soviets can't catch the fish, so they're draining the sea. And it's, it is a very systematic depopulation through genocide, both actually killing people and driving them from the country. It is a systematic destruction of the agricultural system, the livestock herds, the orchards, the crops, of the water systems, millennia old water systems that keep a, a part country like that alive, and of the very ecology. Because if the gorillas cannot find anyone to offer them uh, hospitality, protection, information, whatever. If they cannot find anything to eat, no animal to ride, no water to drink, no stone to hide behind, they cannot survive as gorillas. And this is what the Soviets are doing. Their primary target for the last two years has been the civilian population. And uh, we, we, we know that there are more than 5 million refugees out of the country already. That's out of an original population of 15 million. Imagine that in American terms. And probably another two to three million people have died, both of direct war uh, causes and the indirect causes of, uh, caused by privation, hardship, hunger, disease, and so forth. Famine stalks Afghanistan. There are many areas of the country where there is no food at all. And I have seen myself babies with Kwashia Corps we have a little boy, eight years old, in a hospital in Salt Lake City who is dying. His legs were crushed in a bombing that killed his mother, and he was already suffering from severe malnutrition. In the nine months that it took for him, ten months it took for him to get from his village to a hospital in Pakistan, he had virtually nothing to eat. The child is dying now, not from his wounds, but from the severe malnutrition that has caused his kidneys to fail. They have been unable to operate on his legs because they can't get him strong enough uh, for the operation. You have been in Afghanistan? I go to the border areas. Uh, I'm an Army Reserve officer, and so I am not permitted to, to cross the border. But I go to the border areas where I meet the people coming and going, and the villagers who are just, are just now fleeing from villages that have been bombed and napalmed and gassed. And I, I spend quite a bit of time over there. I've been uh, three times this year already. I understand that the Russians are using Afghanistan as a good testing place for their weapons. What kind of weapons are they using there? Well, they've got laser-guided weapon systems. They've got their Sukhoi aircraft, the whole, you know, every generation. Uh, we've gone through four generations of high-altitude incendiary bombs that are just mind-boggling. These things uh, explode at about 200 meters and incinerate or asphyxiate in the vacuum anything within a several mile area beneath them. Uh, other incendiaries rain gelatinous strips or spongy-like uh, fibers that fall down and when they come in contact with flesh, animal or human, they ignite and cannot be extinguished. Uh, other incendiaries actually turn stone to dust. 
Now, the Soviets are using a wide range of uh, state-of-the-art chemical, biological, and uh, toxin weapons uh, against the people of Afghanistan. Something we have to understand is that for the Soviets, chemical weapons are part of their basic tactical doctrine, and they have no compunctions, no in inhibitions about using them. And they are using them ever more freely, ever more arrogantly, closer to the border. They no longer have any fear of of outside reaction because the world now knows it's happening and, and doesn't seem to care. They used to be very discreet about where they used chemical weapons in hopes that journalists and survivors wouldn't get the word to the outside. But yes, it is a, a research and development laboratory for weapons technology and tactics that we may have to face one day. Uh, Karen, one of the things that you hear people say whenever you talk about a situation like Afghanistan or, or say, in Cambodia when they were killing off most of the people there, uh, people will react and say, well, it can't be terribly serious. I've seen nothing about it on television. Now, that's pretty much the case here. We don't hear much about the Afghan war. Absolutely. There is a blackout in this country that is only periodically punctuated. Uh, I must say the coverage has been a little better lately, but in, la in the last year, there were, were only a few minutes total of Afghan coverage on the major networks, and the year before and the year before. I think the first, I, we, I think we did an estimate, we did a survey rather, I think we came up with a total of 26 minutes of Afghanistan coverage in the first three years of the war. And the, the media, the editors, the producers, have a number of excuses for this. But I think what it boils down to is that they just feel that Afghanistan is not a story to be covered. Certainly it requires a courageous, strong, tough journalist to go in there and do it. You can't helicopter out to the war and go back to the hotel intercon and, and do your story. You have to be prepared to go in there and walk 16, 18 hours a day on vertical terrain, carrying your own gear. Uh, under Soviet air attack, uh, possibility of chemical or, or toxin attack, uh, the threat to the Soviets to shoot any journalist on site. Since the French uh, uh, correspondent uh, Dan Rather, he was kind of, I'm uh, Dan Rather, he was uh, Abouchard, the Dan Rather of Paris, was captured. The Soviets, on uh, releasing him, said hereafter any journalist or, or doctor caught in Afghanistan can be shot. And I think that. Uh, we have some people who just don't have the, the courage to go through the hardships of covering the war. I think some of it's ideological. You can't cover Afghanistan without pointing an accusing figure at the Soviets. You know, Ethiopia can be passed off as, as an act of God, as a, as a natural disaster. Uh, Afghanistan is far worse than Ethiopia. More dying babies, burned babies. Uh, we have a report from two weeks ago in Lagman province. The Soviets burned a two-day-old infant alive on a stick over a fire, like a roasting pig in front of the eyes of its parents. Well, you know, with horrors like this, you can't cover the, the, the Afghan story without pointing and accusing fingers at the Soviets, and I think a lot of our, our media are not ready to do that. Karen, I've heard uh, reports from various sources that the American government is giving enough to keep the war going, but not enough to really make a big difference for the Afghan fighters. Is that true? That is, that is not true. We are, whatever American aid is going in there is so insignificant as not to be counted. Uh, you might as well pour water from a teacup in the ocean to see the water level rise. There, on the ground in Afghanistan, there is no evidence of any effective outside aid. Nothing by virtue of quality and quantity you can even speculate came from American sources, even through a third nation. I think that uh, we're facing a, a disinformation effort that is a combination of our own government, the State Department, the CIA, and the KGB. The Soviets want you to believe that America is behind the Afghans, and that's why they're there. They justify their presence uh, by saying that the American imperialists, the Chinese hegemonists, and the Israeli Zionists uh, are occupying Afghanistan and, and financing the freedom fighters. And our own government would like you to believe it, so you'll get off their back and stop bugging them about helping the Afghans. It's kind of an unholy alliance between, um, between our people and the KGB to see to it that no effective aid gets to the Afghans. But as for us being cynical enough to provide them enough to fight and die 
I, I am not willing to believe that of our government. I am willing to believe that they would sell out the Afghans in, for disarmament or negotiations at any price because we have, uh, you know, the State Department is populated with people who are, are status quo maintainers, uh, who don't want to rock the boat, who fear to anger the Russians, who, who don't want to do anything different or radical like an assertive, affirmative foreign policy that would help people who are willing to fight and sacrifice their freedom. Karen, our time is up. I want to thank you very much for being with us. Well, thank you for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure. We've been speaking with Karen McKay of the Committee for a Free Afghanistan, hearing about that war that we don't hear much about, and telling us about some of the horrors that are going on there. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to have uh, another program here on the Newsmakers Show, and then Friday, Tom Capel of Hartsville with Auto Care. You're saying, what, what's tomorrow's program? We don't know yet. <laughs> That's why I wasn't very specific. But we will be back with you tomorrow here on the Newsmaker Show. Now it's news time, ABC News, and then the local report, and then the Beth Moore Show. All here on 1480 Radio, WLEA Hornell, with ABC and... That show really captured the spirit of the Cold War period from uh, July 3rd, 1983. Kevin Doran talking with uh, Karen McKay from the Committee for a Free Afghanistan. Next up, we're going to hear an ABC newscast from that day, July 3rd, 1983. And in this, they talk about numerous hostage situations from that period. So there's one in particular that they talk about. TWA Flight 847 that was going on at the time. It was hijacked on the way from Athens, Greece to Rome, Italy. ABC News from uh, July 3rd, 1983. From ABC News, I'm Joe Templeton. There's still another report of an arson fire in Southern California, this one with tragic consequences. At least two people have died in the Baldwin Hills neighborhood of Los Angeles. Some 50 homes burned to the ground, many others damaged. Five people are missing. Investigators are afraid they may find some bodies in the smoking rubble. Eyewitnesses say they saw two people setting fire to some brush in the area. Everything is dry as tinder in the California heat. And the flames roared up a hill. One witness saw what happened next. All of a sudden, uh, um, a big flame and, a, and wind brought right over the second story house, right down the street. Just brought it right over the house and the whole street was engulfed in smoke. A woman who ran from the fire says the palm trees were bursting into flames like candles in the intense heat. Damage is estimated at $15 million so far in that Los Angeles fire. There's another warning today from the Islamic Jihad, the group holding seven Americans kidnapped in Lebanon over the last several months. A statement over Beirut Radio said the U.S. and the Reagan administration would be held responsible for any retaliation following the TWA hijacking. The statement said the fate of the seven Americans would be grave if any action was taken against the Islamic Jihad. 300 Lebanese prisoners held by Israel are free. They were bussed from Israel to South Lebanon today and turned over to the Red Cross. And the last five of the 39 Americans held in Beirut for 17 days are on the way home from West Germany today. They left Frankfurt this morning aboard a TWA jet for New York. The five had stayed behind for some more questioning from U.S. officials about their ordeal. And crowds of friends and relatives turned out last night to greet the other former hostages as they returned to their hometowns. In Rockford, Illinois, some 400 waved American flags and sang the Star Spangled Banner to welcome back Kurt Carlson. He told them it was the spiritual support of the folks back home that really helped. I truly feel that if it hadn't been for all of you right out here in all of Rockford, I wouldn't be standing here today. Another one of the freed Americans, Richard Moon, stepped off a plane in Asheville, North Carolina, carrying a small American flag. He was presented with a big yellow ribbon. The returning Americans now trying to get their daily lives back in order. Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev will visit France in October. The visit reported by the Soviet news agency TASS. All right, we're going to end it there because of time considerations. More Kevin Doran shows coming up next week. Stay with us for Dr. Robert A. Heinemann and an all-new show talking current events. That's next.